Hello, Dr. Humans. Welcome back to the channel and to today's video where we will be discussing a clinical trial that honestly, I think every doctor on planet Earth should probably have some awareness of. And that is a New England Journal of Medicine trial known as the FLOW study. Whether you're a specialist, a general practitioner or a doctor in training, this one is going to come in handy. But don't worry, because I am going to make this super fun. Yes, I did say fun. Now, is that possible? Well, that's where the fun begins, because you are going to tell me. I am literally going to let you be the judge of that. Welcome to Journal Club Idol, the auditions. So you get the idea. I'm going to Journal Club my wee heart out. We're going to build out a visual abstract together to make this a more tactile, involved experience. And then at the end of this video, you get to comment. It's a yes from me or it's a no from me. And in that process, I will get clarity on whether it actually is possible to make this enjoyable or not and whether I should ever do it again, ever. And so the fun begins. Let's go. Okay. So we're going to build a visual abstract together. And so at a minimum, you'll need a blank piece of paper and a pen. But if you want to do this in a more digital style, hit the link below to grab your worksheet so we can build this out together. All right, so the FLOW study. This apparently stands for Evaluating Renal Function with Semaglutide Once Weekly Trial. It's a bit of a stretch. Do they have a different alphabet to me? Never mind. Let's explore the flow study. Basically, this was a trial which set about answering the question, what is the effect of semaglutide on chronic kidney disease in patients with type 2 diabetes? And that was an important question to answer because up until this point, the GLP-1 agonists were known to help with weight loss, glycemic control, and to reduce cardiovascular risk in patients with diabetes, but their impact on CKD remained unclear. In previous studies, these agents were associated with a reduced protein urea, but none of the trials were specifically designed to look at these renal outcomes. And so along came the FLOW trial to look at renal outcomes specifically. And this was a well-designed study. It was an international multi-center trial spanning 387 sites in 28 countries. It was double blind, randomized, and it was powered appropriately to detect a 20% difference between the groups, and it used the intention to treat analysis. So in terms of trial design, this is pretty much the gold standard situation. But who was included in this study? In order to be included in this trial, you had to be an adult, a type 2 diabetic with an HbA1c of less than or equal to 10%, and you had to have CKD. But not just any CKD, you had to have high risk CKD, meaning that you fell into these red areas here on this CKD heat map. And as you may be aware when it comes to this CKD heat map, basically the worse the GFR and the more proteinuria you have, the more likely you are to fall into these red zones which correspond to a higher risk of adverse outcomes, meaning risk of CKD progression, but also risk of cardiovascular events and mortality. Red zones are bad. So the trial included patients with GFRs anywhere between 25 to 75 mils per minute but you had to have enough proteinuria for your level of kidney function so that you ended up in these red zones. So all of that to say that these patients had type 2 diabetes and they had high risk CKD. And in addition to that, they had to be established on the maximum tolerated dose of RAS inhibition prior to entering the study. And other drugs such as SGLT2 inhibitors and phenanerone were permitted but not mandatory. And we'll circle back to the SGLT2 inhibitors in just a tick. But first, let's power through the exclusion criteria. Basically, they didn't want anyone who already had end-stage renal failure in this trial. Makes sense. So anyone who had been on dialysis in the past three months was excluded and they excluded anyone with congenital or hereditary renal conditions, including polycystic kidney disease. So just be aware that patients with polycystic kidney disease were not included in this trial. They also excluded anyone with class 4 heart failure symptoms or anyone who had a recent major cardiovascular or cerebrovascular event within the previous two months 
or anyone who has planned for a revascularization procedure in the near future. So pretty stock standard exclusions on the cardiorenal front. And they also excluded patients with potentially unstable diabetic retinopathy and anyone who'd been exposed to a GLP-1 agonist in the last 30 days. So those were the criteria and the trial peeps were enrolled between 2019 and 2021. In other words, this trial was recruiting during the COVID pandemic. And they did an incredible job with over 3,000 patients included in the trial. And these patients were randomized to receive either semaglutide, one milligram per week, or placebo. And they were followed up for a median of 3.4 years. And in this trial, there was a head-to-head -head battle between semaglutide and placebo. But before we get into those juicy endpoints, let's give some airtime to the baseline characteristics of each group. That way, we'll know who we can apply this to when we're sitting in clinic armed with a prescription pad. So basically, the characteristics of the treatment arm and the placebo arm were pretty similar. And overall, it paints the picture, on average, of a 67-year-old with an HbA1c of around 7.8%, give or take, 30% female, 70% male. In terms of ethnicity, 66% white, 24% Asian, and less than 5% black. The BMI ranged widely, but on average, it was above 30. So this was a well-nourished crowd. 57% had diabetes for 15 years or more, 12% were current smokers, and 38% were ex-smokers. The average GFR was around 47 mils per minute, and the majority of patients, 68% of patients, had A3 macroalbuminuria, which means severe proteinuria. In terms of cardiovascular issues, 19% had chronic heart failure and 23% had a previous history of myocardial infarction or stroke. So this paints a picture of the patients that I see in clinic. Type 2 diabetics with high-risk CKD commonly in association with other additional risk factors for cardiovascular events. And in terms of their baseline medications, the majority were receiving RAS inhibition as per the inclusion criteria. 61% were on insulin, 80% on a statin and 50% on diuretics. But a very interesting aspect that I want to draw your attention to is that less than 16% of the patients in this study were receiving an SGLT2 inhibitor at baseline. And that's because at the time of designing this trial, SGLT2 inhibitors had not quite exploded onto the scene like they have today. Nowadays, these drugs are commonplace in proteinuric CKD across the board, whether you're diabetic or not. We are using SGLT2 inhibitors a lot. So that's just something to bear in mind that in this study at baseline, SGLT2 inhibitors were not commonplace. But as the study was in progress, patients were allowed to be prescribed these drugs and the amount of patients on an SGLT2 inhibitor increased throughout the study. So just hold that thought. We'll circle back to that in the trial limitations. And now it's time for the juicy bit, the primary endpoint. Basically, the trial was powered to answer the question, does semaglutide reduce major kidney events compared to placebo? And they defined major kidney events as a bundled together composite endpoint of kidney failure, meaning an EGFR of less than 15, or dialysis or transplant, or at least a 50% reduction in GFR from baseline, or death from kidney related, or cardiovascular causes. So we can see that although this trial is trying to work out how this drug impacts my favourite organ, the kidney, the composite endpoint does include cardiovascular death as well. And whilst that is very relevant because patients with CKD have a higher cardiovascular risk than those without CKD, especially if they have proteinuria, I think it's worth saying that this primary endpoint went just a wee bit beyond the kidneys. Just saying. So that was the primary endpoint. And in this trial, there was a head-to-head -head battle between semaglutide and placebo. Three, two, one, fight. So who won the battle? You guessed it, semaglutide wins. Using hazard ratios, they showed 
that the risk of the primary endpoint was 24% lower in the semaglutide group, which was statistically significant. Now, in terms of clinical significance, absolute risk reduction was not provided, but they did give a number needed to treat, which was 20. 20 people needed to be treated for three years to prevent one primary outcome event, which sounds a lot less impressive than 20%. But the fun doesn't stop there. As part of the trial design, there were pre-specified secondary endpoints. And the good thing about the secondary endpoints is that it helped to tease out the issue that I was having with the primary endpoint in that it was a composite endpoint that included kidney outcomes, but also cardiovascular death. Whereas the secondary endpoints take these same things, but they look at them separately and in slightly different ways. So the secondary endpoints here, in my mind, unpack the components of the primary endpoint. And those secondary endpoints were as follows. The mean annual slope of GFR, the risk of cardiovascular events, including cardiovascular death, and the risk of death from any cause. And they made their way through this list and found that semaglutide compared to placebo reduced the risk across the board. So that's the nuts and bolts of the results of this trial. Now let's quickly take a look at adverse events and limitations before summing things up for the win. Adverse events. One of the most interesting aspects of the adverse events is that they included cardiovascular events, kidney failure, and heart failure. So basically, the primary and secondary endpoints made a comeback here. So the authors of this drug company sponsored paper tell us that there were less adverse events in the semaglutide group as compared to the placebo group but if you take a quick squiz down the columns, it makes me arrive at the conclusion that the adverse events were similar in both groups if you just took away all the things that you already discussed in the primary and secondary endpoints. I mean, is it just me or is that a bit atypical? Moving on, and things you might be interested in, very briefly, COVID-19 related disorders were similar in both groups, GI side effects, a higher proportion of patients in the semaglutide group discontinued the drug due to GI side effects, so 4.5% versus 1.1% in the placebo group, but there was no difference in big things like pancreatitis or acute gallbladder disease. And finally, we arrive at the limitations of the study. You're almost there. You got this. As I said before, this was a well-designed trial, but a key element to highlight when it comes to how we apply these results to our clinical practice is that less than 15% of patients were prescribed SGLT2 inhibitors at baseline. But as the trial progressed, more and more patients were prescribed these drugs in both the treatment arm and the placebo arm. So questions remain regarding what role the SGLT2 inhibitors would have played in these results. But the authors tell us that because more people in the placebo group were prescribed SGLT2 inhibitors as compared to the semaglutide group, that the placebo group would have had an advantage, which I think is a fair point. But even so, this trial is not necessarily showing the impact of GLP-1 agonists in addition to current standard care. And one other aspect to consider here is confounding factors. We know that GLP-1 agonists lead to weight loss and blood pressure reduction as a result. And indeed, in this study, the semaglutide group did lose more weight than the placebo group and their systolic blood pressure was also improved. And this raises two questions. The first is, did the rate of decline in renal function truly improve or was it just to do with the weight loss and the changes in creatinine that come with that? And this does seem to be accounted for in that the cystatin CGFRs were calculated, which are unaffected by changes in weight. So fair enough, the authors thought ahead about that potential problem. But the question remains about whether the benefits seen in this trial were a true drug effect or just a weight loss and blood pressure reduction effect. And at a recent conference when this question was asked, the answer they gave was, well, it doesn't really matter. Whatever works. Even if it is due to weight loss and blood pressure reduction, so be it. Whatever helps. And that is a valid perspective, but I also value knowing what a drug does 
versus what weight loss or blood pressure reduction does so that I can manage things in my clinical practice. So I would actually like to solve that mystery. And the truth is that in my own practice, I'm already using these drugs to help patients with weight loss, whether they're diabetic or not. And when they do lose weight, their blood pressure often improves as a result, and which is great. And now we have this trial which arrives at the conclusion that in patients with type 2 diabetes and high-risk CKD, semaglutide reduced the risk of major kidney events by 24% compared to placebo. And if we treat 20 people for three years with this drug, then we could expect one of them to be spared a major event. But hopefully, if the secondary endpoints ring true, then there might be more potential benefits at play, such as slowing down CKD progression, which is always on my wish list, as well as reducing cardiovascular events. So does this change my practice? Will I be prescribing semaglutide? The answer is I already am prescribing this drug and this paper really just gives me more support in doing so. And because of this paper, I think you'll see a lot more semaglutide being prescribed around the place in this patient group. So that was the flow study and this was the first and maybe the last episode of Journal Club Idol. And if you're still here and playing along with Journal Club Idol, be sure to put in your judgment. It's a yes for me, it's a no for me, just to help me understand what kind of content I should be creating here. If you find these journal article segments helpful or not, I'm unlikely to do that on every video, but just if it helps, I'd, I'd be grateful if you could let me know. That would be marvelous. And otherwise, if you don't find it useful, that's also helpful data for me because I will shift my sights on other content for the win. So thank you so much for your input into that. Um, but regardless, I hope this helped your studies and your clinical practice. And I hope to see you again soon for some more high yield learning. Bye.